you will pose a question to Chad, at which point you will push the green button. When we push the green button, Skeptitron will come in and it will give Chad an additional challenge. It could be a movie title, a name, a phrase, and Chad, because he doesn't have enough to worry about, has to work that into his answer. Now Chad, on the other side, has a red button. If in fact the question is so daunting, mind-boggling, complicated, he's shaking <laughs> in his boots, doesn't have a clue what he's going to say, he can push the red button and get more time. At that time, Skeptitron will jump back in and give us a very entertaining time killer. Clear so far? Sure. <laughs> now we also want to take questions from the audience and we're doing that via text messaging. So if you have a, a question you'd like to ask, the number's up here on the screen, 800-1045. And as time permits, we will in fact take some audience questions as well. Are we all ready, gentlemen? Yeah. Let's begin. Hot seat, your first question, please, sir. Well, actually, I emailed my 15 questions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, okay. what we've well, done it, in the series, we, we, we've, uh, each person has emailed five to 15 questions uh, to get us started so I can do a little bit of research, and then from there, we'll just see where it goes. So uh, where do you want to start? Well, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, as far as you personally or the community, when you hear about Muslims, what's the first thing come to your mind? Okay. Let's push the green button. Skeptitron 3000 will provide a random movie quote for you to use in your response. Please listen carefully to your random movie quote. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Uh, what do I think of when I think, or do most Christians think of, we think of Muslims? I would say um, hardworking, uh, religious neighbors that I both respect and care for. Um, I've had several friends over the years who've been uh, Muslim. Uh, Majad and I met seven or eight years ago, and though we're acquaintances, not as much friends. And Majad gave me a copy of the Quran several years ago, which I uh, thoroughly enjoyed. I've read about 80% of it, and it's just a beautiful version of it. I've had friends down in Atlanta, um, Atef, uh, Debs, and others. So I would say the primary thing I think about, or that most Christians think about, we think of Muslims, would be hardworking, religious, um, Neighbors, because again, the Bible teaches that all of us are neighbors. We should treat each person as a neighbor. And I'd say there's a lot of similarity, and there's a lot of differences between the Quran and the Bible, uh, between Jesus and Muhammad, in that we share uh, the belief in the Old Testament, or the Torah, the uh, and the New Testament, which uh, the Quran calls the Injil. Moses is in there, Jesus is in there. Um, in fact, there's a pretty high respect that the Quran shares uh, for Jesus. He was born of a virgin, he's gonna return, uh, he's done a lot of miracles, this is all from the Quran. So that's a lot of common ground at which to dialogue with. On the differences, of course, would be the problem of life, uh, the solution of life, is it good works, or is it grace, is it a scale, or is it a gift of God? Was Jesus really God? Was he really crucified, that'd be a difference. Um, if he wasn't crucified, then uh, certainly was he, was he resurrected. Um, and I think what happens is that many times folks come together with a lot of stereotypes, and I think the stereotypes is, is where the issue happens. And that's when you have that, you know, Houston, we have a problem moment, because instead of really dialoguing on the educational differences and theological differences, which really do need to be discussed, it ends up being about a lot of stereotypes. So. Is that fair? And, and another one would probably be the nature of God, which we'll get to later, but the, the very nature of what is God like, I think, is, is pretty different between the Quran and the Bible. Okay. Thank you, Chad. Majad, another question. Okay. The second question is, when you see a Muslim woman wearing the headscarf, what's the first thing come to your mind? Okay. Let's push the button. Skeptitron TV theme song challenge. You must quote the following lyric in your answer. Bonus points will be given for singing the lyric. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. <laughs> well, you know, the Bible affirms that God made people of all different cultures and all different tribes. In fact, the, the vision given in heaven 
of heaven is actually that we still have our, our skin pigment, we still have our tribal differences, we still have our sexuality, there's men, there's women, there's people of different cultures. So um, cultures is something that Christians celebrate. So when I see, uh, whether it's uh, an Amish person uh, who have their hair in a certain way or an apostolic Christian who keep their hair in a bun or a Muslim, I'd say, uh, I don't really have a strong opinion except that I have an incredible um, interest for different cultures and, and what brought to that. But I would say the next question would be, um, so it, why is that necessary? And you want to speak to that? Just so, like, from When I see it, I wonder, well, why, do they, why do they do that? Or, or I know the Quran speaks to modesty and the Bible does too, but um, why is that, of all the things, why is that such a strong and important thing? Well, uh, thank you for trying. <laughs> well, you know, Zing. what's like in heaven, you know, everybody gets together and that's the picture of heaven. It's a place where, you know, Everybody wants to go because everyone knows your name. It's the yeah, place you want. <laughs> you know, uh, I was told that's supposed to be fun, and we're trying to, to, to do it that way. <laughs> uh, last night, uh, I was driving with, from Columbus with my wife. We had our first grandchild. And... Uh, <laughs> I met my wife at Ohio University. I graduated uh, from civil engineering at Ohio University. Again, she was not a Muslim at that time. And I think some people know it. You see her on TV, and her name is Karen Debdu. She's the executive director of CARE. If I was asking her this question last night, is what am I supposed to say when it comes to the scarf? Because she does wear the scarf. When we first got married, and I told her, I have two conditions, not less, not more. First, I know that you're Christian. This doesn't bother me because we believe in Christianity. We believe in also in Jesus. I don't care whether you become Muslim or not. Second, my parents. I love my parents. I hope you do not get involved between me and my parents. These are my two conditions. Anything else I'll, I'll talk about and negotiate. But my parents, and my children, I'll take the responsibility and I will raise them as Muslims. If it took her 15 years and then she became a Muslim. Hers, by herself, I did not force her. Then last night I asked her, what do you want me to explain if I was asked about the headscarf? And she wears the, head, uh, the headscarf. You know, she said, she reminded me of what it says in, in the Quran in chapter 24 that first the order came to men to lower their gaze. But the order actually came for men to lower their gaze. It means you're not supposed to look at women. And, this, and to wear modesty. For the order came to men to lower their gaze and wear modesty, modest clothes. And then the order came to women, the same thing. For the headscarf is a requirement, but again, we need to keep in mind that modesty in clothing for men and women. And also Islam really does not differentiate between men and women, except when it comes to how close to God. For wearing this headscarf is first, is the concept of obeying God. Second, modesty. Okay. Good, well that's helpful. Hey, you wanna go to your next one? Yes, please. Yes, we do have a lot of similarities between Christianity and Islam. And when it comes to Christianity, how do you look at all the prophets? Um, yeah, hit button. Thank you, sir. Skeptitron 3000 Fortune Cookie Challenge. Select a cookie from the bowl. You must include the enclosed proverb in your response. Don't be upset if you pick a bad one. That's just how the cookie crumbles. All right, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and use my time killer while I'm thinking about this one. So I hit go on the time killer. Hot seat time killer. Nicholas Cage reciting the alphabet. Yeah, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Peter. Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z! Huh? That's all you have to do!
<laughs> well, you know, I think there are some real similarities between uh, the names of the prophets. If I was to say what is the major difference on the other prophets would be in Islam, typically the prophets are role models, and in the Bible they are object lessons. Meaning in the Quran, they almost always did everything right. For the last time you were with us, we talked about the fact that for you, saints had to be people who were perfect and did stuff right so you could follow them. And I shared with you that take Abraham, for example. Abraham in, in the Quran is almost the opposite of what you find out in the Bible in that we find out God comes to him. The Quran says he was a, believed in the one true God. Joshua tells us that he was a polygamist and God came to him despite his polygamy, not polygamy, his um, polytheist. He believed in multiple gods. Uh, we learned that he's an idol. We learned that he's a, a rebel. We learned that he lies in the Bible, Abraham. Um, we learned that he disobeys God constantly and that God shows his grace to Abraham despite his disobedience. Now, what's interesting, uh, I tried to look this up. Let me think, find the slide that I gave us. Couldn't pull up my air sketch. Um, what was fascinating to me when I was reading the Quran over the years is like here's an example in Surah 16, 120. It says, Surely Abraham was an exemplar, obedient to Allah, upright, and he was not of the polytheist. So here again is sort of a classic. This guy's Abraham is a role model. Be like Abraham. He didn't believe in multiple gods. He showed his gratitude for the favors of Allah who chose him and guide him in a straight way. Now Joshua gives a speech at Surah 16, 120. Joshua gives a speech right before they go into the, to the promised land or to inherit the promised land in Joshua 24. And he actually says that the, the whole story of the Bible is about the fact that God came to people who were rebels and disobeyed him. Here's what he says of Abraham. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, which was Abraham's dad, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times where they, which include both Terah and Abraham, they served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham. So this idea being that God came to Abraham even when he was, you know, he's an object lesson for grace. So in Genesis it says all the things that Abraham did wrong. You know, God says, take your family and get away from your father's house and go to the land I'm going to promise you. And the very next thing we learn is that he disobeys and he takes Lot. Uh, Abraham lies about his wife not being his wife to Pharaoh twice. He sleeps with his Egyptian uh, maidservant Hagar, which is just, almost sexual exploitation. Um, he lets his wife harshly treat a pregnant woman and doesn't do anything about it. And yet, and here's the key, this is what the whole Bible's about in one verse. In Genesis 15, 5, 5 to 6, he believed, didn't work, he believed in the Lord, and God, he, God, accounted to him as righteousness. So Abraham's righteousness came directly uh, from God, not from himself. Did you want to look up that surah? Yes, this is a good thing about the iPhone. You could download the Quran. <laughs> so I'd say that's one major difference. Um, and the other one, let me see if I can find the other verse that I looked up. It was, uh, oh, I know. I was surprised because as I began to do some more work in the, in the Quran over the years, I noticed that even the Quran says that all the prophets were rebels and fell f short of God's glory, except for Jesus. So I'll put them up on the screen and then you can respond. Adam, it says in Surah 722, and the Lord called them, saying, Did I not forbid you from the tree and tell you, Lo, Satan is an open enemy to you? They said, O oh Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If thou forgive us not, so here we wronged ourselves, as Adam speaking, we need your forgiveness. Abraham, it says in the Quran, uh, in Surah 2682, Will you forgive me my sin on the day of judgment? Moses in Surah 2816 says, I have wronged my soul and I need forgiveness. Now that was a little surprising because in general I felt like they were role models. Jonah and the fish swallowed him while he was blameworthy. But this is what really was interesting to me, and this, I'd love you to respond to this. It shows that Muhammad is actually a rebel and a sinner and need God's forgiveness, but Jesus wasn't. So that's why, because this was really shocking to me. It says in Surah 4719, Allah speaking to Muhammad, you know, O Muhammad, that there is no God save Allah and ask forgiveness for your sin and for believing men and believing women. But it says about Jesus, I am only a messenger of the Lord that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. Which again, the Arabic word for that is, I'll probably pronounce it wrong, Zakiah, which is totally without sin. So that was surprising to me that even the Quran affirmed that Jesus was faultless and that Muhammad needed forgiveness uh, for rebelling against God. Is that 
did I misinterpret something or is that new information or? I think so. Okay. Well, first of all, as Muslims, we do believe that we believe in all the prophets. We believe in all the prophets from Adam all the way to Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I say Allah, means God in English. So if you look in chapter 2, the last verses of chapter 2, that to believe as a Muslim, there are three stages actually. Is first, to be a Muslim, there are conditions, what Islam is. You have to believe the oneness of God and you have to believe that Muhammad is his prophet. Then to be a believer, to be a believer, you have to believe in all the prophets from Adam all the way to Muhammad. So we have to believe that Adam was a prophet, Abraham was a prophet, Moses, and of course, Jesus. And we do believe that Jesus was not killed, Jesus was left to heaven, and Jesus is coming back. Now, as far as, if you look at all the prophets, all of them are human beings. They were sent with the same language to the people who they lived with. So if we look at, we look at Adam, for example, he was created by God, and also Eve was created. Yes, they, commit, they made a mistake, and I don't look at what they did as a, mis, as, a, as a sin. Or the other prophets, they are human beings, they made mistakes. But Adam and Eve, both of them, were asked not to eat from that particular tree. And both of them, not Eve, as some people claim that Eve cheated Adam and asked him to do that, she sinned. Both of them made the mistake and they ate from that tree. And they recognized their mistake and they asked God to forgive them. Now, when we look at Abraham, it's completely different than what you read in the Bible. Adam is a prophet. He lived in an area in the Middle East, in Iraq. And of course, his family, his father and his people, they worship idols. He went Abraham and destroyed the idols. Okay? And when his people asked him, why did you do that? He said, ask the biggest idol. He did not destroy the biggest idol. Of course, he made, him, he made them look like they're stupid. They didn't know what they're talking about because the idol wouldn't do anything. But the point is that, yes, all the prophets made mistakes. The verses you mentioned, uh, all these prophets, they made mistakes and they asked God to forgive them. Now, did they do this mistake intentionally or it's not intentionally? As far as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of course, he lived all his life. He, the revelation came, came to him, the whole Quran came to him from God in 23 years. Now, he lived his life by the Quran. If he did something that you consider it as a mistake because he didn't know. And then he was corrected. And he asked God to forgive him. His wife, Aisha, her name is Aisha, asked him, why do you ask God to forgive you a hundred times every night? He said, God created me. Shouldn't I be thankful for him? And he said these exact words, I am worshiping God and I to thank him and I ask him to forgive me because he created me. But that was his answer. But I think in my, this is my personal opinion. I am not here to convert anybody, by the way. Mm -hmm. I am here to express my view as a Muslim. And I'd like to share that with you. As Muslims, even the prophet, peace be upon him, he was told by God, you were sent as a messenger 
to deliver the message only. This is the message you deliver. It. You're not a judge. You can't judge people. Your message is to deliver. Your job is to deliver the message. And the same thing, my job here is to deliver short message about Islam. I am not here to judge, and to judge anybody. I'm not here to convert anybody. Okay. I am here to answer questions. But it's really, in my humble opinion, that for us to think of all the prophets that they sent, because they were the prophets, they were the leaders, they were the people who we looked for to follow. They are not baseball players, they are not football players, they are not doing it for the money. They did it because they believed in it. They believed in the message and they believed in God. And they believe that there is a day of judgment that all of us were going to face that day. Yeah, so I, that's what I would go back to. So again, similar, similar characters in, in both stories, and, but the accounts are very different. And so again, my point, which actually goes with the fortune cookie, you always be surrounded by true friends. When I think of the account of the prophets, I think of, boy, these are true friends who struggled, they lied. I would say you don't ever lie unintentionally. And Abraham did it multiple times repeatedly. It was very intentional. He very much fell short. And I identify with that. Man, that's me. And I would say Muhammad had to, had to ask forgiveness 100 times each night. Yeah, because when's enough? How many times make up for lusting after a woman? Two times, three times, five times. You can never know how good is good enough. You can never have forgiven enough. You can never have prayed enough. You'll never have the confidence of that, that day of scales of knowing that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. You can wish, you can hope, but until that day comes, you're never going to know. And for a Christian, I know for sure that the scale's going to go like this because my deeds aren't on it. If my deeds were on it, it would be like, eh. I mean, the things I've done wrong, intentionally, maliciously, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, I break all 10 commandments. Somebody said, what about the Sabbath? How do you break that every day? Um, I break all 10 commandments every day the way that Jesus interpreted them. It's not just to have adultery. It's to actually lust after someone in your heart. It's not just to skip the Sabbath day every seventh day. It's not to, to operate your life in a place of rest. So I know if my good deeds are put on a scale and my bad deeds are put on a scale, I could never have certainty I would know God. But what the Bible teaches is that Christ's righteousness, everything he did right is put on the scale, and you can know for sure that you will be accepted by God, not just in heaven, but even now. But you mentioned one more thing, let me bring up, and then I want to move to another question. Because um, I think this is key. In Surah uh, 4, if you want to put this up on the screen, Maja just mentioned that the Quran does not teach that Jesus was crucified. And this is really key, because I want to show you how radically different this is. Surah says, they said, in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they did not kill him. In other words, he was not really killed, nor was Jesus really crucified, but so it was made to appear to them. We sort of a, got the wrong guy at the wrong place. Or, and those who differ herein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge. So that's, Jesus was not crucified. Now let me tell you how important the crucifixion is to a Christian. 1 Corinthians, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and that he rose again on the third day. And if Christ was not risen and he was not killed, then our preaching is empty and your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. So it is so critical, Christ's res crucifixion resurrection, that even Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, says, if that's not true, throw it all out. Everything about Christianity is almost worthless because it falls on the, the reality that Jesus came and defeated death by being killed. So that's how radical that particular point is. Is that fair? That's your opinion. And <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't say that I'm right. I, is it fair that that's how radically different the Quran and the yes, Bible see have, that event? I mean, I focus on what the Quran teaches us, exactly what it was said. Jesus did not die. Jesus was left to heaven, and he is coming back. And it appeared to people that he was good. Just think of it for a minute. Allah, God, created Adam from dust. And then created Eve. Doesn't Allah have the capability of creating somebody or for people to see that somebody look like Jesus? He has that capability. 
Sure. And Jesus was born, and his, his mother Mary was virgin. We believe in that. As a matter of fact, if you look in the Quran, chapter 18, it talks about Mary. The name of the chapter is Mary. We believe in Mary, that she is the mother of Jesus. And we believe as Muslims that Jesus is coming back to earth to lead all the people who did all these sin things. Now, I have a question as far as the, when we say, when the Quran talks about as Muslims, we have to believe in all the books that were revealed to Moses and Jesus. I have a question about the Injil, the one you mentioned, yep. that was it written by Jesus? And where is the original book, the Injil? Paul, you know, to be honest, Paul, is he Jesus? Who gave him the right to write the Injil? Did, was it his interpretation? And over the years, for the last some thousand years, did it, was it, is it different than during the life of Jesus? But these are the concerns we have that the Injil, the current book right now, it was written by a human being. It was not written by Jesus. Let, let me answer that because I think that is a great question. I think that is another real critical thing is, is the New Testament as we have it reliable? So let me actually put up the surah that he just referred to. It's in surah chapter 2, 137. It says, we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us has been revealed to Abraham and what has been given to Moses and to Jesus. So here's... Here's, uh, here's uh, Muhammad saying, we believe in the Old New Testament, in their words, we make no distinction between any of them, we are Muslims to him. Next one, there is no deity except him, the ever-living, the sustainer of existence. He has sent down upon you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming, not correcting, confirming what was before it. He revealed the Torah, he who? Allah revealed the Torah, Allah revealed the gospel. So here is the, actually the Quran encouraging all of us and encouraging um, those who practice Islam to read the New Testament. So then the question is, which comes up often, well, how do we know that we have the one that uh, he was talking about? And to me, that's a real easy question. In fact, whether you're, whether you're uh, Islam or whether you're a skeptic or exploring, is the Bible reliable? And here's a quick little time frame. Between 1 and 100 is the eyewitness time frame. There is more manuscript evidence for the New Testament than any other historic book ever written. So you can just stack it up. And I'm saying there is nothing remote, remotely close to the amount of historical evidence we have for the eyewitness time period between 1 and 100. Secondly, then there's the persecution stage between 100 and 325. We actually have letters from the disciples' disciples that quote the Bible. So we know we have copies of the Bible. We can get as close as 30 A.D., to different songs and things that were occurred. Well then, Muhammad is born in 570, I believe, and he gets his first revelation at 610. So he is saying at 610 that he came to confirm these two books. So there's no time frame at which it could have changed before the Quran supported that it's true. Therefore, and during this persecution stage, Christians didn't die for what they believed. People have died for what they believed for hundreds of years. They died for what they saw. They said, we saw him die. We saw him resurrected. So what that brings up is a great conversation for anyone to have. The Bible and the Quran disagree on a historic fact. Either Jesus died or he didn't. Either the Bible has a time frame where there's mistakes in it or it doesn't. That's not a philosophical belief. That's a thing you can investigate, and I would encourage you to investigate that. That is a great question to ask. That is a great thing to discover, because if the Bible is true, and death really was defeated, and there really is a resurrection, it changes everything, and you can have knowledge and hope that Christ is who he says he was, and that God is who he says he was. But if the Quran is correct, then you can't trust the Bible at all, because who knows what other errors are in there? They're wrong about the crucifixion, and that's the focal point of the whole thing. If it's wrong about the major point then you can't really trust it for anything. Can I expand on that a little bit just to add? If you do it quick, then he's going to kick probably both of us. 60, 60 seconds. seconds. All right. You know, there is a challenge for all of us in, in the Quran, in chapter 2 and verse 2. 
It says, by the way, the Quran was revealed almost 1400 years ago. And this is the challenge. Keep in mind, we are, we are educated. When a writer writes a book, he cannot say, I guarantee you this book is for life. This is what it says in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 2. This book, there is no doubt in it, is a guide to those who guard against evil. There's no doubt in it. You can't find a mistake. It was revealed in Arabic, and it's still in Arabic, and you can't find any mistake since for the last 1,400 years. But this is the question I have is, the Injil, was it revealed in English, or was it translated? And think of the phone call, the, what happened with the phone call, people, what happened? And this is our position is, the way it was revealed and the language is written. Yep, and I'd say again, it's a great question to ask, and there's 24,000 copies of manuscripts to confirm that. Well, Whew. anybody want to stick around for another couple hours? Maybe we'll get this one solved. <laughs> anyway, can we please thank Majeb, please, for Pleasure, being, here. being here. You can step down over here. Okay. Thank you, man. Okay, we're going to have a song, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience by text. Let's go. Words are flowing out like English rain into a paper cup. They stir the while they pass away across the universe. Of sorrow, ways of joy are drifting through my open mind, possessing and caressing me. Kai Guru Deva, oh, nothing's gonna change my world. Nothing's gonna change my world. the universe Our Thoughts meander like a restless wind inside a leather box They tumble blindly as they make the way Across the universe Jai Guru Shines around me like a million suns and calls me on and on across the universe. A guy.
You know, I would add on that, you know, that song is how a lot of people think, nothing's going to change your world. And, you know, if the truth is the truth, it shouldn't be insecure, which is why we have folks of differing faith come to Horizon, and we encourage you to investigate this stuff. Now, this series is trying to help thinkers believe and believers think. That's what it's about. And in contrast to Majad, who nicely doesn't want to convert anybody, quite frankly, I am. And <laughs> if, if what the Bible says is true, I want you to believe it. And if what Majad said is true, I want you to convert and believe that. I do not want you to believe superstitious things that are not true. In fact, my daughter went downtown recently and met a Muslim who tried to convert her. I wasn't offended. If what she believes about the Bible and about Jesus isn't true, why would I want her to believe that? And we got into a great discussion about the nature of God, the nature of the Bible, these historic events. So I want to encourage you not to take the attitude of that song, nothing's going to change. Be open to the facts. Investigate the facts and see where the truth leads. All right, let's do a couple Q&A. Very good. We have some questions that did come in from the audience. The first one being, there are many miracles described in the Bible. Why don't these same things happen today? Well, that is... That's Skeptitron TV theme song challenge. You must quote the following lyric in your answer. Bonus points will be given for singing the lyric. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. With a great I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Well, there's a miracle right there. The fact that that purple dinosaur ever became popular and uh, continues to sell is really a miracle. Um, <laughs> You know, when I was in college, there was a guy who created a screensaver that had uh, Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek, and he, you saw the, uh, him dance around, and it said, arm photons, torpedoes. I love you, you love me, fire. We're a great big fam. <laughs> so it was uh, one of my favorite moments. That's how I fit it in, by the way. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that Yeah, you know, why don't miracles happen today? You know, you talk to many doctors here around um, Horizon, and you would actually talk to many folks around Horizon. They would say that they've seen some incredibly miraculous things happen, that documented medical things where God has done miracles. So I think God still does do miracles today. However, the biggest frustration is what about when he doesn't? What about when he doesn't? It certainly seems, even in the New Testament, you get this idea that God's always performing miracles, but even Jesus shows up at the pool of Versailles, and there's hundreds of people who are sick there but he only healed one of them. So even during biblical times, he didn't always heal everybody all the time. But even more so today, you're like, boy, why, wouldn't it be so much easier not to need psychologists, not to need doctors, than to have miraculous healing? And there's a, a, uh, a word called dispensation, that there are different ways God acted or revealed himself during time. And there was a time in the, right between Jesus' Uh, resurrection and the church being formed and during that dispensation God put an awful lot more miracles sort of a super saturation of miracles in there to validate the gospel and validate the message but even when he healed and raised Lazarus from the dead Lazarus then later died right so even when Jesus did a miracle there was still uh, we live in a broken world which I've mentioned several times here so why don't miracles happen today because we're not yet in the perfect world that Christ is going to come back and restore in the meantime sometimes he heals and sometimes he doesn't and quite frankly, I don't know why, but I know the Bible gives you the freedom to struggle and even be angry at that fact. Thank you, sir. We do have time for one more question. Do you think that the stories in the Bible really happened, or do you think they are just representing certain things that happened? Skeptitron Name Dropper Challenge. Use the name of the following famous person in your response. Your name to Trump is David Copperfield. Oh, all right. Well, that's a great one. Do I think it really happened or did it appear to happen? You know, I'm a magician, and I have followed David Copperfield for years, and one of my favorite tricks that he does, David, David and I are like this. He's the crooked one. Um, <laughs> and I love when he made the Statue of Liberty disappear for example, and he uses a magic piece. You can see this on YouTube, or, or cover your ears if you didn't know how he did it. So what he did is he actually had the stage facing the Statue of Liberty, and he put a curtain over the stage, and what the audience didn't know is he actually rotated the stage 180 degrees where he'd built another stage that was empty without the Statue of Liberty. So, oh, I'm a magician. I give away the secrets. So I'm a bad one. Um, <laughs> but it's all on YouTube. And what happened is it appeared that the Statue of Liberty had disappeared, but all they really had to do was look behind the curtain behind them, and it was still there. 
So that's actually how he did it. And I think a lot of people bring that idea into the idea of the Bible. Well, there's good lessons there, which is what uh, Ben Kaufman said to us a few weeks ago. There's good lessons, a good moral fable, good moral fables. It doesn't necessarily have to have really happen. I believe it all really happened. I believe it's a historic document. I believe it claims things that are historical. And it's not just my belief. It says it's a historic document. If you look at the book of Luke, the book of Luke says, I'm a historian, I'm a medical doctor, I'm writing to Theophilus, I went and checked the facts, I talked to the eyewitnesses, I looked into this, this is a news report. So to say, well, I don't know if we should take it as news, if you wrote a news report and handed in, somebody says, oh, well, that's, a, that's a fiction, you'd say, don't call it what it's not. You can say it's bad nonfiction. You can say it's not accurate nonfiction. You can say it's a wrong news report. But don't say a news report is really a fable. And I would say, give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. Don't pr- try and help it by saying, well, it meant this, but it really meant this. It makes some radical claims about God, radical claims about Christ, radical claims about what really happened. It needs to fall or succeed on its claims. And if its claims are historically true, it changes everything. And if it's historically wrong, then you shouldn't believe it. In fact, that's, I'll put one more air sketch up. If you have it uh, up on the screen, uh, let me find it real quick. Um, Because I think this is key as well. Nature of God, let's see, crucifixion. Here. Whether or not Jesus Christ was really crucified and resurrected. Now, it may be that it was the appearance, like the, the Quran says, that it appeared like somebody died, but I would say, could God do it? Yeah. But why would God want to deceive us? Again, the rebuttal might be, but yeah, then he told us that he wasn't trying to deceive us. But here is a Jewish historian named Josephus. Here's a Roman historian named Tacitus. And here's a Greek writer, all writing during that time period. And the three of them who did not have a bias toward Christianity, they didn't believe in it, all three of them said, Jesus died on the cross, there was a wise man named Jesus, da 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 he was condemned to die, uh, he appeared afterwards, Christians worship a man to this day who was crucified in Palestine. So for me, I can look at the facts that the Quran says, the facts that the Bible says, and then I can say, what do the historic facts validate? One of these accounts is right, one of these accounts is wrong. Doesn't mean they disagree on everything, but on the things they disagree on, that's what we need to explore. We have time? We're out of time. Thank you, Chad, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for being here today. Again, we'd like to help uh, you continue to explore in your journey. We're going to be, next week, uh, Pete Bronson is with us. He's going to ask a lot more questions specifically on this Bible reliability (laughs) and some ones that you've texted in. So if we have not gotten to your questions, just know that Pete and Ken's actually going to be interviewing me in two weeks, and he's going to take all the questions that have come in over the last couple weeks we haven't gotten to and go through that. So thanks for being here, and again, we would love to help you on your spiritual journey. Again, if you're a thinker, we want to help you believe. And if you're a believer, we want to help you to think. On your way out, third door on your left is the hearth room. If you're coming to the baptism service, it's today at 12. Thanks again. We'll see you all next week.